to say that The Forever War is the best science fiction war novel ever written is to damn it with faint praise. It is, for all its techno-extrapolative brilliance, as fine and woundingly genuine a war story as any I've read. William Gibson The Forever War takes place beginning in the distant future, the year 1997, and ends in 3138, though only about four or five years of objective time has elapsed from the narrator's perspective. The story is sprawling, imaginative, tragic, heartbreaking. It's sprawling not in the sense of many characters, but a single character spread thin across time and space. Originally published episodically in Analog Magazine in 1972 while being queried to publishers, it was a hard sell. One publisher rejected it, saying, No one wants to read about Space Vietnam. But then it was published and won the Hugo, Nebula, and many, many more awards. The author Joe Haldeman served in Vietnam and was a Purple Heart recipient, so when he writes about the horrors of war, he's not talking out of his ass. The Forever War is both a fast and easy read in terms of the prose. The style is straightforward, and it doesn't beat you over the head with its message. Nor does it spoon-feed every point it's trying to make. It's a wildly imaginative book full of technological and cultural futurisms that serve and enhance the themes. It's not flawless. It's certainly got an outdated view of sexuality, but I think that's worth looking past. I love this book, and now I'm going to tell you what's to love and what's not perfect, but there will be some minor spoilers. I'm not going to spoil much, just talk about themes and character and pacing. There isn't much I could spoil, certainly nothing in the vein of revealing that Tyler Durden was dead the whole time. But I'm putting this warning here because this novel is, in my opinion, worth experiencing raw. Now I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. Two grenades tore up the ground 30 or 40 meters from the structure. In a good imitation of panic, it started belching out a continuous stream of bubbles. The context is that this is the first ground combat encounter with the enemy, and their ineffective weapon system is a bubble blower, with the twist that the bubbles are death to the touch. Try to look past the goofiness of that visual to the phrase, in a good imitation of panic. This line in particular stuck with me long after I first read this book. Why not just write, it panicked? Because it's not human. It's alien. And the narrator has been conditioned to dehumanize them. No way is he giving the enemy the benefit of the doubt. They don't fear. That's a human emotion. Therefore, they don't panic. I think of this when I see ants panic. Because they do. Poke one and see its behavior change. See it change direction. Speed up. Evade. As if it fears for its life. Most people, they'll tell you insects don't feel things. Based on what? That they're small? That they're alien? Before you dismiss what I'm saying, or worry that I'm going off on some crazy tangent, or I'm about to try and sell you on the idea of veganism, I'm not. I'm just trying to point out how powerful, how meaningful this sentence fragment was to me to emphasize how good this book is. I know it's not news, that it's easy to dehumanize, I mean, ants. I'm aware that people dehumanize other people. Believe how bad these people are. These aren't people. These are animals. And we're taking them out of the country at a level and at a rate that's never happened before. Starship Troopers the movie is not like its namesake book, nor is it like The Forever War, but I'm reminded of this scene. What's it thinking, girl? It's afraid. It's afraid! The recognition of alien fear, rather than sparking empathy, sparks this hateful joy. This fiction novel made it harder for me to kill ants. That should be my whole book review. How many books have had that sort of impact on you? And it wasn't even the whole novel that had that impact, it was this sentence fragment. And that is far from the only place where Joel Haldeman slips in perhaps just a turn of phrase, this microscopic little insight that made me pause and set the book down and think. And that for me is what makes The Forever War stand a step above. The novel doesn't tell you what to think, it just tells you what happened to this character and lets you judge it for yourself. Well, I judge The Forever War to be a brilliant anti-war novel that almost doesn't even deserve the classification of military sci-fi, since that genre is packed with war glorification. There is no glory here. 
Haldeman uses the extensive tools of science fiction to illustrate the breadth and depth of loss, of thievery perpetrated by hawks, war profiteers, and the complacency of those unable to imagine alternatives to endless war. Some readers have criticized the character development and pacing of the Forever War, but in my opinion, they're wrong. The main character doesn't change much over the course of the story, and he also doesn't drive a whole lot of the action. But that's the point. He's just trying to survive as he's bounced around like a human pinball in the noisy and senseless machine of the war. He's numb, his main conflict being an internal conflict against numbness and desensitization. And in the end, what has he learned? How has he grown? Not at all. This is war, not self-help. What about the pacing? Well, it's not a modern pacing for a novel, and some of the odd structure might come from the fact that it was originally published in pieces in a magazine, but some of the strange structural choices are by design. There are a surprising number of anticlimaxes throughout the story, but this only emphasizes the arbitrary nature of war and how the randomness erodes morale and sanity. There are build-ups to battles that either never take place or are so one-sided that they can hardly be called a battle at all. It's not a contest. There's no grandeur. It's just violence. One of the reasons I love science fiction is because of the ideas. The Forever War keeps up a relentless stream of technological and social innovation, which can be overwhelming to the reader. The reader is made to feel as overwhelmed as the narrator who is adrift in a world passing him by. But this is where I think one criticism of the novel is warranted. The treatment of sexuality is flawed. Specifically, whether a person is heterosexual or homosexual is treated as a learned behavior or a choice rather than as innate. Of course, in the distant, enlightened future in which we live, 1997. We know that people are born the way they are born, and those who believe otherwise are a minority of vocal but dangerous individuals who are screaming about public education training kids to be trans. Putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Female sexuality is also a little bit problematic in the book. Early on, women are mandated by law to be promiscuous, but it's not treated as a horrific government overreach, and all the women seem to be pretty excited by the idea, with a small number of notable exceptions. These takes on sexuality are not creepy author insert fantasy, but do serve the narrative, but it is still a little bit misguided viewpoint that happens to align with some truly deranged individuals in modern America. This is one of the few books I've read more than once, and I see new things upon each reading. Despite some flaws, The Forever War is a brilliant novel, worth reading, worth discussing, worth appreciating for its sci-fi ingenuity, as well as its insights into the gravitational pull of war.